Hey, hey, everybody, it's Eddie from Tokyo. This is your cryptocurrency update from Japan. Here I have the Twitter page of Richard Cornfield. He's a gentleman that lives in England and occasionally we communicate on Twitter. He sent me two hours ago something very interesting I must show you. It is a presentation that Dilip Rao, of course, who is the Ripple Global Head of Infrastructure and Innovation, it is a presentation he put together in November, and it shows the Ripple API interfacing with payments across any network, including Uber and Amazon. So interesting. I will put the presentation uh, in the comment section down below. I think it's something you will be very interested in reviewing. And here we have a decentralized travel site. You can book up to 550,000 different hotels in 210 countries using Ripple's XRP. So they have a travel destination of 82,000 worldwide places on Traveler. It is the next generation online travel agency. It's good to see these decentralized applications and websites starting to take hold and get traction. All right, this is an interesting report. So BTI put together a new report that just came out and only Binance and Bitfinex, according to the report, are exchanges that are not falsifying the trade volume data. data. So they are reporting their accurate trade volume and not doing wash trading. So Wash trading is a form of market manipulation and investors, you know, they will sell and buy at the same time these financial instruments or assets to create a misleading artificial activity. And in addition to wash trading, you can also do a little bit of market manipulation with bots. They can uh, hype a specific token or asset. And OKX, according to this, really stands out in doing... Um, that falsification along with hit BTC. They are doing a lot of wash trading in the top 25 pairs. And BitThumb is shown to do wash trading with Monero, Dash, BT Gold, and Zcash. So I don't know. Um, and also they put together, let me show you, this exchange list of advisory. Uh, there are 84 on this particular list and it's not just those that are doing manipulation or falsely reporting their volume but um, also those that are charging a little bit too much in their listing fees so the average cost to be listed on an exchange is about fifty thousand uh, dollars sometimes it's paid in bitcoin so that range is from two bitcoin up to 75 Bitcoin. And I think what they say here is we strongly advise you to contact them before paying the listing fees to any of these exchanges. They have a report that I think um, will show you if that exchange is out of line or not. So it's kind of interesting. All of this, by the way, will be down in the comment section below. All right. Don't forget this Tuesday, the final Ask Me Anything uh, of Brad Garlinghouse is going to take place at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Mark your calendars and uh, share your questions. So I was just looking through the questions. There are a lot of replies. Sam I Am <laughs> looks like he got the very first question in, but it's not the only one he did. He actually asked three different questions. All of them are really, really, very good questions. Thinking Crypto also had a very good question in regards to the dozen of dozens of banks that are supposed to go live in 2019. And he asked if that is still on track. He got a th 113 likes to his question. Look at Sam's first question here, 616 I like hearts. So Sam's questions are really good. Um, it was funny, digital asset investor asked Brad if he was on the nice list, as in 
this season's naughty or nice. So um, there are some very good questions. And uh, just don't forget to set your uh, calendar for that time frame. And if you miss it, um, I think you'll be okay because, well, the last one they did, they streamed live. I don't know. Maybe someone can tell me in the comment section if they have seen that this year, if they are, or this particular one, if they are going to stream live like the others. So it'll be interesting to see. Although, um, wow, how can you choose from all of the questions that were asked? That is a tough job. Okay, we are jumping already into the fluff. It is kind of interesting. This is one I have wanted to do for a while. Uh, these are komainu, and you might also, in the United States, I think we called them foo dogs, but in Japan, they're not called that, and they are the guardians, usually to the entrance of a temple or a shrine, and what's what you need to know about them is, if you notice, one has the mouth closed and one has the mouth open. So the one that's closed is the one that says, mm, and the one that has the mouth open is, ah. So we talk about, ah, un, and it is really a Japanese concept that is about being able to have nonverbal communication. So that nonverbal communication comes in many forms. Um, boy, you see it a lot here in Japan because nonverbal communication is very much a part of the culture. Uh, it could be as simple as an older couple who have lived years together and they'll be at a restaurant and they don't speak to each other, yet there is I'm sure great communication happening. And people really respect this ability to have a ah-un relationship. Um, I also see it um, in particular, there's a Michelin star restaurant that I go to in Azabu Juban and it's called Piatta Suzuki. And they have, um, they have been keeping their star rating for a few years, which is very difficult to do. And when you sit at the counter, which has only five seats, I believe, and four tables, it's a very, very small uh, Italian style, Italian Japanese style restaurant. Anyway, um, the chefs who are highly skilled and competitive rarely speak. So you see this ah-un relationship among multiple people working in a very close quarter under very stressful and high demand situation. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it is quite something to witness. And then I, I saw, you know, there's just so many examples of A'un in many cultures, but in particular, Pan, you can search the nonverbal communication on Google for Japan and you'll see lots of academic papers. So it's a very interesting topic. Another place you see it is in the traditional kabuki theater. And let me just show you, this is where you have the performer who in kabuki is a male, even though it is dressed as a female, all the actors are performed by males. And then you have the singers, you have the people playing instruments, and you also um, then can watch this nonverbal communication because you have to be totally in tune with the performer without any uh, verbal communication. So here is a really great example of that with traditional Japanese music. Let's just take a quick peek. Timing is very important.
It's just incredible timing. Um, I really want to introduce Kabuki to you if this is a new form of art that you've uh, seen maybe but thought, oh, this isn't for me. Well, let me tell you something. It is for everybody. And if you come to Tokyo or even go to Kyoto, they have a Kabuki theater too. Um, it is something that you really need to see, not only because the theater is spectacular in Tokyo. It was built in 1899, and it was just recently redone, remodeled on the inside. Um, it was retrofitted for earthquake, actually, and then it was also improved in many ways with carpets and paint and everything else. It's just really spectacular now. Um, the Kabuki Theater, which was created more than 400 years ago, is all about pageantry, stories. The stories are often very dramatic and tragic. The costuming is elaborate. The makeup is unbelievable. There is so much emotion and the music is really incredible. So don't worry about the language. At Kabuki Za, they have a translation in English so you can totally understand the story and don't let anybody scare you with the cost of tickets yes if you do a full day here is the um, picture of the interior of kabuki Zaw. if you do a full day event it is going to cost you minimum two hundred dollars a seat and can be even more expensive if you sit up in this um, area here but don't let that scare you because there are same day tickets that you can go for a one act and one act is probably going to be maybe long enough for you to really experience it 45 minutes to an hour and you can get in for like 20 bucks so if you don't mind waiting uh the same day about two hours before the event actually starts you can see um, Kabuki in the real live theater and it is just fabulous. I wanna show you one last photograph to just give you an idea of how elaborate the costuming is and the facial expressions and the movements and the stories and the music and the sets, everything together it is a wow experience. And I just hope that even if you think it's not up your alley, give it a try. I think you will be so pleasantly surprised. Okay, everybody, that's all I have for you today. Take care. Sayonara for now. Bye-bye.